first things first. Uh, if you look at Dr. Altman's uh, commentary on Hebrews, and then, uh, not excuse me, his Ruckman Reference Bible. Uh, a lot of you have the Ruckman Reference Bible, so I'll start it out by reading the intro there, if you have it. <clears throat> it says, No one has as yet located for certain the absolute author of the book of Hebrews, and there is much uh, controversy about it. One thing is certain, the last chapter, the last chapter was written by the Apostle Paul, which is why the King James translators gave it the title of the Epistle of Paul, the Apostle to the Hebrews. Okay, so if you look at Hebrews chapter 13, if you turn over there, you'll understand what he's talking about. If you're familiar with uh, reading uh, Paul's writings and his other epistles, when you look at Hebrews chapter 13, notice right here uh, that he mentions in verse 23, our uh, know ye that our brother Timothy is set at liberty, correct? You also notice in verse 24, salute all them that have the rule over you and all the saints they of Italy salute you. Grace be with you all, amen. When you compare that with uh, the last verses in Paul's other epistles, that's, the, that's his style of writing. You might recall that. He, every Pauline epistle, I always says, grace be to you, amen, right? So it's nearly all the time. He also mentions salutations. Yeah. So we've seen that. Also, if you uh, read chapter 13, notice the verses. <clears throat> if you look at the verses, it's kind of similar to uh, his style of writing in the last chapters or his other epistles, which is why Dr. Upman strongly be, uh, believes that the last chapter is written by Paul. Okay, now, uh, who do I believe is the author of Hebrews? I am open to uh, whoever it is, but in the meantime, I strongly believe it is the Apostle Paul. He is hands down uh, the author. That's what I strongly believe in. The reason why is because uh, Dr. Rutman, his guesswork is usually right, and he believes that the last chapter is written by Paul. And when I compare the last chapter with other writings, it strongly matches with Paul. And then with uh, Rutman's opinion, it makes me believe that. Some other Bible-believing preachers that I respect, they believe that it was Paul. Uh, another one is the KJV translators themselves. The KJV translator said that it was the epistle of Paul. Yeah. So then when I look at that, I'm like, well, you know, that's quite a number of sources and authorities. Yeah. So that's the reason why I tend to uh, go with Paul. Yeah. Now, I'm going to read you Dr. Upman's uh, commentary on Hebrews. And then uh, he has some uh, interesting opinions from uh, some of the early Christian writers or church fathers and then the, the silly debate of people going back and forth, the Alexandrian scholars and everybody, on who is the author. But Dr. Upman says at the end, you know, just take your pick. Every man, you know, has the freedom to do so. So, so I will read from his, uh, let's see. He mentions on the preface <clears throat> thus uh, on page uh, Roman numeral 12 the school at Alexandria thought that Paul may have written it although there were North African churches who rejected the Pauline authorship origin was undecided the North African churches that rejected Pauline authorship ascribed the epistle to Barnabas, Hippolytus. Uh, so Hippolytus denies Pauline authorship. Harnack thinks that Aquila and Priscilla wrote it. Martin Luther favored Apollos as the author. There's a lot of, there are some Bible believers who are wondering if it's Apollos as well. So Apollos is probably the second strongest contender. The earliest date for the writing of the epistle is around A.D. 51. According to most scholars and the commonly accepted date by all apostate fundamentalists and dead orthodox evangelicals uh, is somewhere between A.D. 80 to 86. Dumlau assigns it to A.D. 68 and goes to considerable length to show the Alexandrian nature of the epistle 
rather than the Palestinian nature. Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown also take a pre-AD 70 date and note that Hilary of Poitiers, Lucifer uh, of Carthage, and Ambrose of Milan all ascribe it to Paul. The earliest traces of the epistles being quoted are in the spurious Clement of Rome epistle, supposedly written around AD 98. Other scholars who favor the authorship of Barnabas as opposed to Paul are Weiss, Renan, Salmon, Ailes, and Vernon Bartlett. So it could be Barnabas who wrote it. Barnabas could also be the third contender. The reason why some people think that it could be uh, Barnabas or Apollos is because the Jewish nature of the writing. So Apollos, because he is more of a, uh, it seemed like more of a Jewish ministry, so then that's why Hebrews would fit more well with Apollos. For Barnabas, he had experience with Pauline ministry, Gentiles. But then if he did also uh, minister to the Jews, spent a lot of time with them, it could explain the double application. But anyway, let's keep reading here. Um, since not a man in the group ever belonged to a New Testament church or believed that any book on this earth was a holy Bible, their conjectures may be dispensed with. Siding with Luther, the theory that Apollos was the author, are Bleak, Tholuck, Hilgenfeld, Lunemann, Rus, Feiderer, Alford, Farrar, and Plumpcher. Von Soden, Julischer, McGifford, Schurer, Weissacker, and others believe the letter was not written to Hebrews at all, but to Gentile kin but to Gentile Christians. It's a free country, take your pick. Accepting or rejecting any of the above theories will not open one word in one verse for you anywhere in the entire book of 13 chapters. <laughs> if you do not care for any of the theories above, there are those who believe that Silas wrote it. So believe it or not. There are others who also believe that Aquila and Priscilla may have written it, okay? So the author we don't know. But to me, the strongest contender would be Paul. That would fit very well. Uh, and there are those who believe that Philip, the deacon of Acts 6, wrote it. And there are others who hold that some character named Aristion wrote it. You go out the way you came in. Not one man who espoused any of the theories above could expound Hebrews 3, Hebrews 6, Hebrews 8, Hebrews 10, or many portions of Hebrews 4 and Hebrews 9. You will never learn any Bible from such men. All right. Then. So the conclusion is we don't know. All right, so, but these are some interesting uh, figures to uh, think about. Doesn't matter who you think uh, the author might be, but uh, what we do know is that uh, a lot, some, uh, most of the Bible believing authorities that I would see and myself would point to Paul. So that's what I can point out to you. All right, so that's uh, continuing on with the intro to Hebrews. Dr. Ruttman says in his Ruttman Reference Bible, The verses that seem to indicate that Paul didn't write it are Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 14, chapter 10, verse 39, and chapter 13, verse 22. The verses that seem to indicate that Paul did write it are Hebrews 13, verse 25, compared with 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 17 through 18, 2 Peter 3, 16. Uh, I would highly recommend to have a Ruckman Reference Bible because all of these notes would be given out pretty much to you, all right? So if you don't have one, our church, we do uh, sell some, actually. So if you want one, we can give you one. Um, let's see. The possible alterna alternatives, which are suggested by dozen recognized authorities, are Silas, Apollos, Luke, Clement, Barnabas, Tertullian, Irenaeus, and Anonymous. I personally think that Paul wrote it immediately after his conversion. See Galatians 1.17. This would set the date for the main part of the book at A.D. 35, making it the first New Testament book ever written. <clears throat> I figure that he was down in Mount Sinai or Arabia 40 days and nights, getting his information and purposely avoided identifying himself as a Jew who had abandoned the Hebrews' religion. We will date the book based on this guess. The book has 13 chapters, 303 verses, 6,913 words. The theme is better things. In the book, Jesus Christ is better than angels and better than Old Testament priests. Amen. He brings in a better hope than that found in the Old Testament, 
along with a better testament and a better covenant that had better sacrifices connected with it. He came to prepare you for a better resurrection to a better country that has a better inheritance connected with it. Hebrews is not written to the body of Christ, a local church or Christians. It is written to Hebrews. Nothing is said in the entire book about the law being replaced as you find in 2 Corinthians 3, 3 through 16. The book appears to be aimed at the kind of people found in Acts chapter 21, verse 20 through 24. <clears throat> Hebrews is a transitional book like Matthew and Acts, <clears throat> which takes you from the church age into the great tribulation. As such, it is the greatest stumbling block in the New Testament for carnal Christians and Bible correctors. Okay, so <clears throat> to understand about uh, how Hebrews, the author of Hebrews work, all right, I'm going to get to the interesting part about biblical hermeneutics. You ready? I'll probably expound it a little bit more when we get into Hebrews. But I'm only going to say this probably one time, all right? So you, you might want to pay attention to this part. The most powerful tool that I'll ever teach you on hermeneutics is general epistles. So I want you, uh, for those of you who always want to learn that, Bible study, like doing it yourself, this is the class, okay? So this is a class you don't want to miss out. So in hermeneutics, here's the idea. Uh, the mistake a lot of people would make, I think, is that when they take general epistles, they'll collectively just simply think it as a transitional book. When you do it that way, it becomes very confusing. Because uh, let me give the common sense uh, gist here first, all right? Common sense gist is this. Here are writers who are living during a timeline of the tran so look at this right here okay so there is a transition between the church age uh, and the cross of Christ okay during this transition this is what we call the Acts the timeline of Acts it's a transition that went from Jew to the church see that when we come to the Apostle Paul we know clearly that Pauline doctrine or the church age doctrine is clear and there's no Jewish doctrine involved. So those, that's the epistles of Romans to Philemon. All right? That's hands down, no doubt, referring to the church because he, his ministry was directed toward Gentiles, correct? You might recall that during the timeline of Acts, God was going back and forth with Jew and Gentile. Jew and Gentile, Jew and Gentile, Jew and Gentile. But when uh, we do know now, hands down, we do know now that God's no longer using the nation of Israel, all right? He's concentrating on the church. If a Jew wants to get saved, he has to come to the Gentile church. He has to go to the Gentile Christians in order to become a saved Christian, right. okay? That's, so a switch from Jews to dealing with Gentiles. That's very important to understand. So if you know that background, we do know then how are we going to find the right doctrines then, being... Uh, Gentile Christians, if God's ministry is toward Gentiles. It's Romans to Philemon, right? Those are Gentile works. So that's very clear. So that's where we know we can get church age Christian doctrine, and this was written by Paul. But during this time, this was so back and forth, God was going back and forth with Jew and Gentile. Now, think about this. <clears throat> Besides Paul, the remaining apostles during this time, they were dealing with this transition. Their ministry is primarily to Jews. Paul was mainly for the Gentiles, okay? Later on, when we pass the transition of Acts, then sometime later, we get up the apostles who are becoming more, uh, who are aiming more toward Gentiles. There's no doubt about it. And they're dealing with Christian churches. So then their teachings are changing more and more because their ministries are changing. So then here's the problem then, okay? The problem is the writers of the general epistles, the question is this. They are at a timeline now where God is dealing with the church 
And if you look at these general epistles, you'll notice that they do deal with some Gentiles, okay? So then uh, when, we when they do deal with Gentiles, I mean, what are you going to do then? They can't just teach Jewish tribulation stuff. But then they do teach Jewish tribulation stuff. So if you just use common sense, here I am writing a general epistle, and I'm writing it to a bunch of Christians. Why would I teach them Jewish tribulation doctrine, right? So then that's a common sense issue. But then there's no doubt when you read the writings, there is it is clearly evident that the writing itself, the writing material, the doctrine in it is Jewish. The writing and the doctrine is Jewish and it's tribulation. So then, because the writer is writing to, let's say, here's a bunch of uh, Christians, and then he's, wouldn't he write Christian stuff? Sure. But then here he is writing Jewish tribulation stuff. Wouldn't it be better if he just said, hey, for Jews in the tribulation, it's this. For, Gen for those who are Gentiles under the church, it's this. Wouldn't that be easier? That would be far easier. So then this is quite an issue and a trouble. So then how do we deal with this? The idea that, is, that will be very helpful is you compare Scripture with Scripture, all right? How you compare her hermeneutics before. All right, the writing and doctrine is Jewish tribulation. What is that? Here's the key word. Mark it down, all right? This is the number one element why dispensationalism is actually born and part of the reason why we do get into current events, all right? And recognize some conspiracy theories. It's called prophecy. This is the key word you want to know, okay? When you look at prophecy, okay, in the Bible, there is absolutely no doubt, especially messianic prophecies, that you get double application, triple application. Now, I don't have to go to the verses. You already know that, all right? So there are too many verses. Uh, David... Uh, the psalmist David said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, right? When, when, in a verse like that, historically David is talking about himself. But then we do know that it is a doctrinal application to Jesus Christ the Messiah being crucified on the cross. So you see right here how one verse has a double application. It has a historical application for David's timeline. But then it has a doctrinal application to Jesus the Messiah. Here's a second example, okay? Uh, David said, they pierced my hands and my feet uh, in that same chapter. Now, that never happened to him. But what we could say is historically, and here we go, okay? So in this biblical hermeneutics, there's a threefold application. But I am going to specify the threefold application, okay? In the threefold application, you have historical You have uh, doctrinal, and then you have spiritual. Okay, so here it is, historical, doctrinal, spiritual. This is the threefold application. Now, to be uh, easy, the easy part is this. Doctrinally wise is Jewish tribulation. We can clearly see that one for general epistles, right? But then we see a double application here, all right? The double application is that we see that there are some New Testament Christian doctrines as well. So what we're going to put right here is Jewish 1, uh, let's put two, all right, that way it could look like in sequence. Two, and then one right here we can put uh, Christian. Doctrinally, you get there, and then also it seems like that there is Christian teaching here. So then why would there be both? doctrinally. Well, the, 
easy answer to why we can see that it's doctrinally both is when you compare scripture with scripture. When you look at general epistles with other Pauline epistles, they match in doctrine. But then when you compare general epistles with um, Old Testament prophetic verses about end times, and then Jesus, what he preached in the four gospel about end times, that's Jewish tribulation. So then it's clear from the writings that you see Christian and Jewish doctrine. You cannot be a hyper-dispensationalist after that, nor can you be an anti-dispensationalist, okay? Or think that there's no uh, double application in general epistles. There's no way you can do that. To apply it only to Christians in the general epistles is ludicrous. There's so much Jewish end time doctrine that matches with Old Testament verses right. and what Jesus talked about tribulation. To only apply it uh, to Jewish tribulation is also ludicrous itself because you can see from Pauline epistles that it matches with Christian verses. So scripture with scripture is, uh, is king, is king to tell uh, the doctrinal distinctions. Now, then we come right here, right? Historically. What is the historical application here? When we come to historical application, this is important to understand, we collectively, like, like I said, the mistake we make is we combine collectively the general epistles. I think that's the mistake. You don't combine it all together because each book is written by a different author. Even by the same author, they write different books. Why would they write different books? If they're writing different books, there's a different background. So what I believe is with each general epistle, listen, you have to take case by case. You have to take case by case. You have to take case by case for the historical application. Why? Because each book historically was written with a different background historically. That's important to understand. For example, it's written to Hebrews, right? When we look at uh, the book of Hebrews. But when you look at Revelation, book of Revelation is end times, right? But it's, historically, we see seven churches here. See, so you have to realize that with each general epistle, or uh, let's say this, any book in the New Testament that is not Paul's epistle, okay? Non-Pauline books, you have to take case by case. Let me repeat that again, all right? For the historical application, it's very important to understand that each book is different. Okay, you got to keep that in mind. Historically, each book is different. That's extremely important to understand. That's why there are some people who take Hebrews and James, some Bible-believing teachers who take Hebrews and James and apply to, to simply tribulation Jews. Okay? Not the Christian church. The Christian church could be more applicable if you look at Peter and John's epistles and Jude and Revelation. So you can see mostly, uh, you can see a lot of church age doctrine on those epistles. See, a lot of people make this mistake, okay? They, because they collectively put general epistles all together, that's why they think, well, it must be written to only Christians, or then it's written only to tribulation Jews. No, when you look at book case by case, it's not like that. What you're going to notice is, for example, Hebrews is, if it was written during the old days of Paul, okay, and he wrote it, during the transition of the Acts, see that? If he wrote it during the transitional time of the book of Acts where God was dealing with he Hebrews and tribulation was still being discussed, that would make a lot of sense for Hebrews. If James was written during this transitional time, before Paul gave the mystery, okay? So before Paul gave the clear uh, gospel presentation of church age doctrine, we can see Hebrews and James written beforehand. And that would explain immensely about uh, tribulation doctrine and Jewish doctrine. Does that make any sense? Mm -hmm. yeah, but then we see the Christian church being introduced because of Acts chapter 2. The Bible talks about the Jews starting a church, right? But this was based a lot, notice, on a Jewish doctrine. And they were expecting and anticipating for their Messiah to come with the kingdom at Acts 2, 3, and 4. 
It was at that timeline. So the mystery of the body of Christ, Pauline Christian doctrine, is not uh, clarified or given by Paul yet that time. Even Paul, while he was at Sinai in the desert, he was, pro he was in that learning process himself. He had to learn it for two years, actually. So if he wrote this before then, then that would make immensely a lot of sense. If what Dr. Upman says is true, he wrote this at Sinai, and I'm really leaning toward that, this would make a lot of sense, the writing of Hebrews, as well as James, see? But think about Peter and John and Jude. These are the people who already know Paul's dealing with the Gentiles. That's why they give a lot of Christian doctrine in their verses. But within it, there are undoubtedly elements of Jewish end-time doctrines behind it still. Why is that? Why would they write it that way? Because historically, we see that uh, according to... Uh, ah, man, I don't want to turn over there. All right, no, I'm not going to turn over there, all right? But like 1 Peter chapter 1... The Bible talks about how uh, the prophets of old time, they were preaching and teaching what they learned from God, but they didn't understand it clearly. Yeah. Peter even admitted that Paul's writings are hard to be understood. Now, for us, it, Paul's writings are not hard to be understood. It's the easiest. Peter's writings are the ones that are hard to be understood. Those Jewish apostles' writings are hard to be understood because they are very uh, different from Christian doctrine. Why would Peter say that way unless he has that Jewish background who's being introduced, see, more and more to Christian doctrine? See that? So in Peter's mindset, all right, Peter, uh, you got to understand that these apostles, we don't know what was really inside their heads, okay? But it is Undoubtable, in every historical time period, and I would, I'm going to even include church fathers, I'm going to even include us Bible-believing preachers today. Have there not been times that we pre preached and taught something, but loosely tongue-in-cheek, but then when we closely examined the verses or what we said and studied that doctrine more intensely, that we were like, oh, I didn't mean it to come out that way? Or there's something more here than I never thought about before. Yeah. So that's important to understand. If you think Peter, John, and those guys, uh, just like us preachers and teachers, they're just preaching and teaching what they know from the Word of God. But if you give it centuries of time of studying the preaching and teaching the, and the doctrines that they give, look, the stuff that I'm teaching you guys, all right, I guarantee if a hundred years pass by, and then I took a time machine and zoomed 100 years later, those people would take my teachings and found and discovered more things that I never thought about before when I taught and preached that before, if that made any sense to you. Bro Pastor Kim, remember you said it this way? Oh, yeah, I did it, but I didn't mean, I didn't think of it that way when I said it that way. That's a pretty good thought. I never thought of it that way before, you know? So that's important to understand is that if you look at every church father, preacher, teacher throughout history, is that what they've, what they've done is that they're just teaching and preaching what the best that they could know. But then later on, as people study their materials more and more, then different doctrines come out from the preaching and teaching. Then these different doctrines that are more specified and clarified from, their, from the older's preaching, teaching, and writings, then they debate about it. And then they find out what's really true over there. So we have to understand that uh, Peter, John, and these people, they're just simply going by like the Old Testament prophets, like those guys who did not understand 100% or everything or did not know as much as we would now today since we got the whole Bible that we're studying, they're just simply preaching and teaching the best that they could from what they know. And then what they knew was, Peter and John, was Jesus' end-time tribulation teaching toward Jews. And then also they were being introduced to Paul's writings. So that's all they were doing. Here's an example of a hymn, all right? I'm spending a lot of time on hermeneutics, but that way we can understand Good. what's going on here. So let's take the hymn, for example. A lot of these hymns we sing and we shout, right? But let me 
challenge you this. If you take these hymns, these lyrics, and doctrinally, technically examine it, I guarantee you this. Uh, divided amongst different denominations, you can get five different doctrines from what that hymn writer originally wrote from one verse, all right? Here's an example. Uh, it is well with my soul. And Lord, haste the day when my face shall be sight. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall resound. The Lord shall ascend, uh, descend. Even so, it is well with my soul. Now, to us, we're singing, praise the Lord. That rapture is going to sound, right? Uh, uh, but wait a minute. There are people who believe, no, that's not pre-tribulation rapture. They claim, no, notice the words right here, the clouds be rolled back as a scroll. That matches with Revelation 6. And that is a post, so that proves Christians will go through the tribulation and then will get raptured. But then us pre-tribbers will say, no, notice right here in this line, he said, even so, it is well with my soul. Even so, when you look at Revelation 22, it means, uh, surely I come quickly, amen, even so come, Lord Jesus. In other words, the rapture could happen now. They don't have to go through a tribulation. What do you think Horatio G. Spafford's thought? I don't, I didn't mean all that. What, what, what in the world? I, ne I, never thought, well, I never thought of it that way before. Wow, I guess I'll have to, I didn't think that there would be post-trib or pre-trib when I wrote it that way. I was just simply thinking about Jesus coming down. Yeah, amen. Now, see that? That's good. Okay, so Peter and John, they're simply talking about what they know. Okay, Jesus Christ died on the cross. Salvation by faith. If, uh, a say believer that there should be fruits and works manifested out of their lives. And then they thought about, you know, going through the tribulation. So then during the tribulation timeline, you got to be careful. Salvation can be lost, etc. Jesus Christ will come down. They all know this, but they weren't thinking about all these different doctrines, see, about eternal, uh, like eternal security or by... Uh, um, conditional salvation or um, uh, all this kind of stuff, see? So, yeah, or, uh, the repentance doctrine, lordship salvation, uh, sinless perfection, they weren't thinking all this kind of stuff. See, they were just simply talking about, hey, I know that uh, sometime the, Jew uh, the Jewish people, that they're going to go through the tribulation. Us Jews are going to go through the tribulation. We're anticipating the Messiah to come any more mo moment with his kingdom. Uh, we got to endure. We can't fall into his system. We are saved by faith in uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then as uh, saved believers, good works should be manifested out of their life. See, that's all they're thinking about in their, in their heads right here. And that once I receive salvation, also that uh, it is eternal and that it will remain with me. So that's all they're thinking. But they didn't spend time like us about, well, then what about this? What about that? What about this? What about that? Because of the way you wrote it out. Well, I never thought of it that way before. <laughs> See, you have to understand that they're just simply going by what they learned by that time period. It wasn't until church fathers and the Catholic Church and Orthodox Church, doctrinal debates were a big issue. All right, doctrinal debates were a big issue. During Paul's time, they were starting to critique, question the word of God, bring in false doctrine. But it wasn't until that they died out, now their writings are being disputed. See that? They're disputed. So it's the same thing like these hymn writers. We could do the same thing. It's, I guarantee you this, a hundred years later after I die, all my teachings and preachings online, people will be arguing what I really meant. All right, and then I'm going to be thinking, I never thought of it that way before, you know. You want evidence of today? Evidence of today is even my mentor, Dr. Uckman. Yeah. You take his writings. <laughs> there are five different kooky guys out there who will say what Dr. Uckman really meant to say. Yeah. That's just common sense throughout history. So we have to understand that the historical application, we have to realize that we have to take case by case, each book is different. And that these authors are just simply going by what they know. What was actually swimming inside their heads? I don't even know what was actually swimming inside his head, even if he wrote it, all right? I won't even know myself many times, all right? If I turn 80, you show me what I actually said on the video, what I preached, now, and then this is what you really meant. I might go, did I really mean that? You want evidence of that? Talk to my wife, all right? My wife, when, when uh, she said, well, you said this before. I said, really? I said that? And I said, 
Well, when I said it, I meant it differently this way, right? Now, you got to realize this, folks, is that um, a lot of people, they don't think about that historical application. That's an indisputable fact, okay? So we have to realize that with these writers, with each and every word what they were writing, they didn't know 100%. For you to say that, you're a dummy because even preachers and teachers, every word that comes out of their mouth, they don't know 100% either. They're just speaking to the best that they know or what's in their heart, right? And it just comes out like that. But the Lord uses it, right? So we have to understand that's the same thing with these writers, okay? Then what is the job of the people as time passes by? The job of the people is it is good to have disputes. It is good to have studying. It is good to distinguish these doctrines and find out what the Lord really wants from us. So key champion interpretation of Scripture is always Scripture with Scripture because God won't contradict himself. You get 40 different authors right here and they don't know 100% what they were writing down. But know this, it's not them. At, they're not the ultimate author. It's God. God knew and he used that and he put that in his book. So he knows that his words are not going to contradict his words. So that's, it's up to us to determine what the real meaning behind the words are and then what the real doctrine is and what the real truth behind it is. Okay? So to put the authors into your plane, that's not a good decision. Okay? That's not a good, that's a mistake every scholar makes. All right. Any common sense person and even scholar will admit this, especially studying church history and even church fathers and everybody it is an indisputable fact that when authors are writing, give it 50 years later. All right. There's going to be people debating about what it, the author really meant. And the author never meant it that way. He was like, oh, I never thought of it that way. I guess now you could say it that way. I never thought that deeply. You know, that happens. That happens. Okay, all right, so that's the historical application, is to realize each book is different. And then also, you have to keep in mind that uh, the author is just simply speaking what he knows. It's the same thing with those all Old Testament prophets. We don't really know what's in their head. Was James thinking about tribulation time period, what they have to do faith and works for salvation? Or was he thinking about a practic uh, practical application that because you have faith that uh, works should be manifested outside of your life? To be honest, I don't know what, James, what, what thing was swimming inside James' head. But I do know this, doctrinally, when you look at those verses, that matches with end time Jews and tribulation, and that is faith and works. That one I do know for a fact. Historic, we can, historically, my advice is this. Don't try to figure out historically what the author was thinking, because the author, there's a very good chance, didn't even think about that either. All right? That's the mis number one mistake nearly all scholars make. So I hope people and Bible believers who are hearing me teach this one will be eye-opening. Because the greatest evidence is also other biblical writers as well and authors. They weren't, th they did, I mean, do you think David, when he was writing about, he pierced my hands and my feet, what do you think he was thinking? I don't know either. Was he foreseeing about a Messiah who would be crucified? Or was he talking about himself in a figure of speech that his enemies were piercing him? Or, or uh, was it that his heart was broken so it felt like his hands and feet couldn't move? I don't know, but who cares, all right? <laughs> So stop trying to figure out historically what the author was thinking, okay? That's the mistake to find the right interpretation, all right? That's a mistake. What you want to do is to look at the doctrine itself. The doctrine itself, and then you compare Scripture with Scripture. That's where you get the right interpretation. You want to know the doctrine behind it, all right? Historically, what the author was thinking, I don't know. But uh, stop trying to figure it out because I guarantee you this, you will never figure out why David wrote the psalm that way. All right. Judges, you, you, you hear it in Judges, in Judges chapter 5, they're singing about God coming down with the army on Mount Sinai and stuff like that, conquering the world. That's a prophecy about Second Advent. Yeah. 
That never happened during their timeline. So what were they thinking? I don't know. Maybe they were thinking that God's spiritual army was with them. But they're not on Mount Sinai, so I don't know what they were thinking about that time. So maybe they just did it for poetry or added it for a song. I don't know. Same thing with Horatio G. Spafford. I don't know why he would write it is well or even so in there, okay? But it just sure sounds nice. So I'll just add those words down there in my song, it is well with my soul, because it just sounds nice, all right? So we have to understand that. Have you ever seen somebody who tried to take you technically? Yeah, that annoys you, right? That's what you got to understand. You don't want that kind of mind with these authors, all right? All right, anybody wouldn't like that, okay? So if that's where you're trying to derive the right interpretation by historically, then you're wrong, okay? To be honest, if you go historically, I've already explained to you, Historically, it is a given fact and truth that the, each background is distinguished. It's distinguished. And these uh, people have a Jewish mindset. And it, they mention about tribulation. And they've also had dealings with the Christian church. That's, that's an undoubtable, indisputable historical application. Then what was it in their mind when they're writing it to so-and-so? Stop trying to figure it out. You'll never do that with even the Old Testament books, okay? Okay, so that's a historical application. Spiritual is pretty simple, okay? Spiritual is what lesson you can learn from it, all right? Spiritually as a Christian, okay? Simple. Okay, now we're done. We move on, all right? <laughs> all right, now that you understand uh, how each epistle works, then we now know what Hebrews is, right? Hebrews is, uh, I've already given to you, this background is very, very possible that it's only tribulation and only Jews, all right? We see about the New Testament. We see about Jesus Christ bringing it in. Uh, but there is no Christian church age doctrine right here. You can get the New Testament, the new covenant coming in with Jesus Christ. However, we do know this is tribulation is after Jesus died on the cross, right? So tribulation, you can still be in the tribulation with tribulation doctrine, hearing about the death of Jesus Christ, all right? And how they apply uh, the covenant from the cross and the shed blood of Christ is actually very different during the tribulation compared to the church. And I will explain that to you once we hit Hebrews 10, okay? So that, so that is very, very possible, what's going on in Hebrews. If it is writing... Uh, towards some Christians at that time. It could be possible, but it's very hard to uh, put the context of this background into that when you read the writing and everything. All right, so let's go to uh, Hebrews, all right? But I am open to uh, Christian doctrines in Hebrews. I am open to that one as well. So that's important to understand. All right. So remember, Book by book, case by case, you have to do that, okay? You can't just say all general epistles Christians, all general epistles Jewish tribulation, all right? Then you'll be hyper-dispensational or you'll be anti-dispensational or uh, a dispensationalist who doesn't know dispensational salvation, okay? All right, uh, let, now let's begin, all right? After mumbling and jumbling for 50 minutes, okay? But that was the most important study in hermeneutics, okay? All right, Hebrews chapter 1 now, all right? Now we're going to start out at verse 1. God who has sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets. Okay, uh, remember I'll be explaining each and every word from the verse. So it's speaking about God and what did he do? He, during uh, different times, sundry is pointing out different, okay? Different time periods and in what? Different manners, okay? So that means different ways, different ways. He spoke in the past to what? Our forefathers, the Hebrews' forefathers. So this is Jewish, all right? God didn't speak to Gentile fathers, all right? He was speaking to the Jewish forefathers by the prophets. So the prophets were speaking to them. So notice right here, this proves dispensationalism, God dealing with uh, different people during different time periods. That's very clear, right? Yeah. Now, now go to 1 Peter 1. And then we'll go to Galatians 3. Here are the three verses that will prove that one. All right. Galatians chapter 3. And then we'll look at uh, Hebrews chapter 1. 
uh, excuse me, Galatians 3 and 1 Peter 1. What am I saying? So notice right here, here are the several verses to use to prove dispensationalism, okay? That there were differences of the time period, especially salvation as well. There's absolutely no doubt about it. Hebrews 1.1 1, 1 is a clear verse for that one. And then the other one is 1 Peter chapter 1. The Bible says in verse 10, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you, searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify, when it testified beforehand the suffering of Christ and the glory that should follow, unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us. See that? So in verse 10, <coughs> that salvation by grace is ne has not been revealed to those prophets. They simply prophesied that should come to us in the future. So during the Old Testament, they never had salvation by grace through faith without works. We got to experience that one. Verse 12, it says, it was revealed not to them, but to us. See that? Now go to Galatians 3. Galatians chapter 3. And then verse 23, all right? Notice right here, but before faith came, see, before salvation by faith came, we were kept un under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. See, so notice right here that during the Old Testament, they were kept shut. They did not have access to that salvation by faith. They were under what? The Old Testament law. So if you look at this time period right here, you see the blue marker Jews. And uh, I've explained everything about the transition with Paul right here. But during the Jewish timeline, they were stuck unto, unto the law right here. All right. We're going to go back to Hebrews 1. Hebrews chapter 1. Verse 2. The Bible says, Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, uh, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. Now that's a mouthful there we're going to examine. So the author is saying that uh, God in these last days spoke, is speaking to us by Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is the one that God appointed to become the heir of everything uh, in the universe. Uh, by Jesus Christ also... Uh, he also made the worlds, so everything in the universe itself. All right, so let me explain each and every part here. So God is speaking what in the last days. You see that? So the writer is writing as if he is in the last days. Now look at Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. And then we'll read verse 5. 5. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to what? Come whereof we speak. See that? So what the author is about to speak is about a future end time. Last days. He clarified that at Hebrews 1, 2 and he Hebrews 2, 5. So that already gave you, see, case by case, right? Yes. So case by case, the author is ex expecting to write, I'm going to be writing to tribulation. I'm going to be writing about end times. So that's what he's going to be doing. So he's going to be writing about the end times. Sometimes uh, an author, they'll give a heads up like, hey, this is what my topic and subject will be. And then maybe in between, they'll get out of the main topic and talk about a side topic, right? Yeah. That, that people could practically apply to themselves. So if that does occur in Hebrews and the Bible does have a history of authors doing that. Sometimes they'll be talking about a main topic, but then they'll get outside of that topic to talk about something else where you can practically apply to yourself. And what the greatest evidence is, is me, all right? I'm the evidence. I do a teaching, but then I talk about something that I'm like, hold the phone, and then I want to give a practical application to you guys about learning something, right? So that does happen in Hebrews. So if Hebrews does that, where he's talking about tribulation and times, then whenever he goes off topic or practical, it will be because there's another doctrine in there that he's talking about during the tribulation that could be a good side note for his timeline for the church, for the Christian. So if that does happen when there are Christian doctrines there, that's why he will do that, all right? That's pretty common in the author. 
But there's no doubt primarily that book is going to be end times, all right? And that church age Christian doctrine will be mentioned rarely, okay? Will be mentioned rarely. Okay, let's see onward here. Uh, so he's going to be speaking about tribulation doctrine. But then the amillennialists, postmillennialists, and all the other millennialists, and all millennials are just bad people anyway. So when you hear these kind of uh, people who uh, focus on these doctrines, they believe this, that currently that God's future kingdom is ongoing and that we are already undergoing the tribulation. The current government system is the Antichrist and we're going to conquer it and we're going to build the kingdom of God on this earth. And that's a lie from the pits of hell. That has been the cause of wars yeah. and violence, crusades, okay? Because they're trying to build God's kingdom, all right? That's why they get so much involved heavily in politics and stuff like that. So you have to understand this, is that we do not believe in this kingdom building mentality. Postmillennial or amillennials, they believe that either God's kingdom is ongoing or they're fighting the tribulation and they're building the kingdom, okay? Either way, they're both wrong, okay? If that is, uh, if what they think right here in verse 2, the author is saying, we are fighting and building the kingdom. We are undergoing the tribulation right now. Here's the problem. If you look at ver the next part of verse 2, it says, whom he hath appointed, what? Heir of all things. Wait a minute right here. So Jesus Christ is supposed to be the ruler and the heir of all the universe. He did not get that yet. Okay? Because why? Look at Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. And go to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians. Some Calvinists, uh, they ignorantly say that uh, because Jesus Christ died on the cross, he conquered the kingdom, and now uh, it's his kingdom battling against the kingdom of the devil. And No, that's baloney right there. That's not how it works. You've got to realize Jesus Christ, that he's going to take over the kingdom in the future. All right? Not now. He's not taking over the kingdom right now. The kingdom belongs currently to the devil. All right? Our kingdom is a... Uh, we're not building God's kingdom. We're not going to bring it. He's going to bring it himself. And this is in the future after the tribulation. Not now. All right? So you got to look at 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 4. The Bible says, In whom the God of this world had blinded the minds of them which believe not. Notice right here, this current kingdom belongs to Satan. See that? Now look at Revelation chapter 11. Revelation chapter 11. Now, this is sometime in the future, right? All right, look at verse 15. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are what? Become. Are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Look at that. So this is in the future. He's going to get the kingdom back to himself. So this is sometime in the future. All right, so we are not in God's kingdom right now. This is, I mean, if you think this is God's kingdom, then you might as well be atheist, all right? Why would God's kingdom have suffering, have pain, all right? God's kingdom is perfect, pure, heaven, bliss. You, you get corruption, pain, you don't blame it on God. You blame it on the devil. You blame it on mankind because this is their kingdom. So I don't know why all of you think that we're doing such a good job and you keep wasting your life on this current earthly kingdom. Right. All right, the be best thing you'll bring is more pain to yourself. That's the best you'll ever produce, to be honest. Okay, uh, go to Matthew 21. Matthew 21. Here's a parable about the, the father's son. All right, so Jesus Christ, correct? And he's coming in and he's about to uh, get the vineyard or the kingdom to himself. So I guess he, uh, I guess he gets it, right? You know? Well, yeah, when he died on the cross, I mean, he owned the kingdom after that? No, look at this verse, all right? Look at verse 37, Matthew 21, 27. But last of all, he said unto them his son, saying, They will reverence my son. But when the husbandmen saw the son, they said among themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and let us seize on his what? Inheritance. And they caught him, and what? 
cast him out of the vineyard and slew him. Oh, I thought that the death of Jesus Christ was a victorious thing where he was able to claim his kingdom. No, they threw him out. All right? The kingdom that they're not thinking about is Jesus Christ, when he comes down, he's claiming an earthly kingdom for himself as an earthly Messiah. The problem with Christian churches is they're all thinking it's a spiritual kingdom. All right? That's their biggest mistake. No, throughout the... I'll tell you, those Old Testament Jews knew their Bible. They knew the kingdom. It was an earthly, physical, literal kingdom. Do we believe a spiritual kingdom? Yes, there is a spiritual kingdom. That happened after Jesus Christ died on the cross. But that is not currently what's going on right now, and we're all living happily ever after. No, Jesus Christ is saying in the future, in the tribulation, I will get my earthly kingdom back. To reject that is to uh, not do him any good, not to do right. Jesus good. Okay? So when the uh, author says, in these last days, he's talking as if he is in there. He's going to be talking about tribulation time. But that is not, uh, that is not today in the church age. So then how does this work? Go to Acts chapter 3, and then we'll finish it off here, all right? We'll finish it off here. I wish I could uh, come to the world's part. That would have been an interesting teaching. But anyway, <clears throat> the Jews, they're waiting for their king, right? So since they're waiting for their king and kingdom, they were getting their chance. So because they're getting their chance, at, that's why Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3, that wasn't like a, the church uh, gospel or anything like that going on. Yeah. If you look at uh, Acts chapter 2, uh, Acts chapter 3, I said, right? Sorry. So and then if we go to Acts chapter 3, notice right here, they were waiting for Christ to bring in the kingdom. Verse 21, Acts 3:21. Whom the heaven must receive until the times of restitution of all things, which God has spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So notice right here that they're waiting uh, for their times of restitution. Verse 19, repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the what? Presence of the Lord. They were expecting him to come down at any moment and then bring in the kingdom. So that's why, remember, this is during the transitional time period. They're still waiting for their king and kingdom. They have not been fully cast out yet, okay? Hebrews give that kind of appearance as well. So then here are the Jews waiting for it. They're anticipating. So then the uh, if they received that Messiah, if they received that Messiah, then they... Uh, would have uh, undergone the tribulation and everything, but what do they do? They reject it. So because they said uh, no and rejected it, that's the reason why this church age, 2,000 years, we're living, we're undergoing that right now. That's why you see right here this uh, bridge, right? So if this bracket is a church that just stuck in between in the Jewish clock here, see that Jews right here? So this church was just crammed in like that, all right? So because uh, they, because remember, originally they were supposed to deal with the Jewish people, right? Jesus Christ, that was his ministry primarily. The apostles had that in mind. But because they rejected it, they turned toward the Gentiles instead. So we see right here that that's the reason why if Hebrews was written during this transitional time, it makes sense the author would say in the last days. Mm -hmm. See that? Because he's, he's writing as if about the tribulation is going to occur, that the Antichrist can come any moment. Mm -hmm. So it makes perfect sense how Hebrews can be written right over here. But then when you look at Peter and John, that's post-Pauline, right? See? So that's why it's important to take each book case by case with general epistles. You don't collectively put them all in one uh, application historically, all right? Historically, different authors, different backgrounds, different time periods. When you are to do that, then it will be more eye-opening that way. The big debate about general epistles is not the doctrinal dispute. It's more of the historical dispute, I see, all right? A lot of them don't realize that, 
Okay, so I've, that's why I spent a lot of time with the historical application here, which should be very, very convincing. All right, it should be convincing enough. The doctrinal is not uh, uh, indisputable. All right, there's no dispute on this. It is Christian and Jewish. All right, there is absolutely no doubt about that when you look at general epistles. There's no other way around it. All right, and the evidence will be when we keep going on in this class. You're going to, so far. You've seen tribulation, right? So, so far you saw tribulation and Jewish. And then you're going to see that when we compare different verses. Scripture with Scripture is ultimate king of interpretation to Amen. find the right doctrine. It's God's word. Heavenly Father, I pray that tonight's teaching was a blessing to the hearers and increased our knowledge of the Scriptures and dispensationalism uh, for both newcomers and seasoned people and make them see the importance, the importance of rightly dividing that word of God, whereas other churches are not doing that nowadays. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.